Peace. Okay. All right. That echoes gone. We're going to start off um, with Bilal and then we'll bring Daruba in. Bilal, what's happening, brother? How you feeling today? Hey, man. You know, it's like uh, one day at a time, man. Um, trying to, um, you know, make sense of this, ad, which is um, a stretch, you know, because um, you can't make sense of um, of this. You know, it continues, uh, um, you know, to happen. And, um, you know, our people have to begin to um, look at this police terrorism for what it is and, um, you know, look at another approach, strategy. You know, I often think about uh, the movie The Godfather um, when they killed um, uh, the Godfather's uh, son and they brought all of the family to the table, uh, you know, and gave him an offer that he could not uh, um, uh, refuse. And um, this is what, I mean, this is, is exactly what's going to have to happen, man. We can't keep um, uh, watching our people just slaughtered in the streets and, um, you know, just marching because that's right. not changing anything. Uh, uh, cutting cameras on, you know, people are talking about cameras, sensitivity training. This is a bunch of BS because you can't, uh, uh, um, you can't train, man, a, a psychopath. Right. For, folk, for folks who are not familiar because, um, you know, oftentimes we take for granted that, um, you know, because we know what's going on in the world, should know what's going on, right? Um, give us a, um, a background on who Najee Seabrooks is. I know he's 31 years old, um, murdered on March 3rd. You know, give us a little bit of background. I know you, um, you know, you have ties with the family. And aside from that, you know what's going on in the streets right now. So walk us to where we are, then we're going to get analysis from D. Um, Okay, well, you know, uh, you know, Najee, um, you know, was a basketball coach, you know, was a basketball coach, you know, involved with the uh, Patterson um, Hill and uh, Collective, you know, the group. Um, these are grassroots brothers and sisters that, um, you know, we've done work with them over the years and they put this here collective together um, some years ago. And um, they go into the interior of the neighborhoods and begin to, um, you know, uh, recruit brothers and sisters, you know, uh, um, bring them into the, uh, the formation so that we can uh, get uh, some handle on the internal conflict that is uh, sending so many of our young brothers and sisters uh, to the cemetery at an early, um, early age. So he was, he was definitely um, engaged uh, um, in that process. Now, you know, what happened, um, and, and a cheerful person, as you can see, every picture, man, of Najee, man, that smile was there. Yeah, that bright smile, man. Very uh, cheerful. You know, the last time I actually seen him um, was at um, February the second. You know, they had a uh, a a graduation a graduating class for the uh, the next uh, group of our young brothers and sisters who had graduated to be a part of the healing collective and begin to become actively involved um, in the community. Now, on March the third, you know, you know. I mean, I could just play it back to you like this said. I got a text to my phone. Got a text to my phone, you know, that there was a lot of activity down on Mill Street in Patterson, Mill Street and their market. But it was just scant, you know. I didn't know what's what. I'm, I was at work. I couldn't get down there because it was busy. And um, then I heard more information that somebody was uh, shot. Still didn't have enough information I, when I got off work, you know, I finds out, uh, um, you know, that um, they had killed uh, uh, um, not down there, you know, um, based on um, um, a call, you know, uh, that he put out, you know, for help. Put the call out to uh, the brothers and sisters that are part of the Patterson Healing Collective, who should have been the first responders, number one, because they're trained to deal with these here crisis uh, 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 situations. The, uh, the the special agents of the state, the police, did not respect them, told them to stand down, threatened to mace them, and would not allow them to intervene. Um, the Texas of um, uh, uh, how Najee was communicating with everyone that was on the outside, that was right outside of the building, uh, is still in their phones, where he was saying, listen, I, let me just hear your voice. Hear your voices, I'll come out. Hey, let me hear your voice, you know, because... Um, they're gonna kill me. Hmm. They're gonna kill me. Yeah, he said this. Said this is all in the text. We uh, we put it on record uh, last week at um a city council meeting, and um uh, that's what they did. They pushed everybody out of the way 
while the, his mother and family were standing outside. We talk about a person man, that was just in a crisis. He wasn't crazy. He had a crisis as it's part of the dynamics, man, of a human being. We go through emotional and rational um, uh, uh, cycles of, of uh, imbalance sometimes. And he reached out to his people and they, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, um, they murdered him, brother. Straight up murder. Oh. So, so basically, you know, he, for, for the record, he calls his people, he's having some type of crisis. And, um, you know, I understand that, that, that his team comes out who are qualified and certified in regarding to, to dealing with, uh, mental health issues and crisis, so on and so forth. And the police refuse to let them in. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Okay. And so they end up, they gun them down and, um, after and, brought, him, and, and, and brought and brought him out naked the same way they would uh, take um, the African and tie him up and whip him um, before the whole community as to uh, send a psychological message, you know. So, so you mean to tell me that they they murder him? His family's outside. Absolutely. They carry him out naked. What what was um, I mean? What did they say? What was their excuse? What was their because I understand that they're saying it was some type of standoff, but I mean there was no one in the house, correct? It was there, there was no hostage there or anything, you know. I mean, he was having on um, the problem, he was in the house right there. And I mean, if you can believe this, which I'm sure you won't believe this here, they had the audacity to print in the newspaper out here in Patterson that three uh high-ranking anonymous officials, uh um uh, went on record to say that um, they um, they, they use less lethal uh, methods uh, um, to uh, bring them out, and the less lethal was their gun. Could you could you? I mean, can you believe that so, that they so what, shot their guns and said that was less lethal because there was some water on the uh, on the floor? Okay, so it was less lethal than um, them them bombing the house like they did move. I guess, huh? Yeah, it was less lethal than that. I mean, th this shit is amazing. I mean, so has there been any? Um, have they released any any uh, 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 body cams or is there any footage or what, what's the deal with that? No, 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 no body cam or anything um, has been released. Uh, we, we we are calling for that every day. Um, in fact, when I get off here, you know, we, we'll be calling the. Uh, attorney general's office and um asked for the uh, release of the body cam the only thing they did release was the um they released the names of um um these here uh, uh armed agents of um of the state that uh continue to um practice um a uh, terrorism in our neighborhoods so they did release the names uh so what what has been the community's community's response well you know the uh, the community man is uh, um um uh, Deeply, man, traumatized, uh, you know, uh, by this here, you know, uh, the um, the like, I mean, the public execution of um, of Naji, man, it has really um, affected the entire man spectrum of our uh, community. There's been several uh, um, demos. I'm sure there's going to be a big one today because there's a live city council meeting uh, where this is actually televised, and um, we're calling on um, um, uh, the city council uh, as well, who's sitting there. We don't know why, why why are they just sitting there waiting to hear a response from the um the AG. You know, they need to open up their goddamn mouths. I mean, with the exception of Councilman Michael Jackson, who was always like the lone fighter on behalf of the people. He's always on the side of what's right when it comes to um empowering the people. No doubt. I wanna um ask D, since we have him on the line, through what's happening, you can unmute your mic. Um um how did you how did you get involved in this situation? Uh, uh, comrade uh, Bilal um, called me and was you know he had he had, we we talk often almost daily and uh, he told me that you know this brother Naji was recently uh, killed and uh, murdered and that Naji had worked with him and some of the interveners there in Patterson. He's a young man, you know. Um, and as he pointed out, you know, he was into physical ed with the, with the local community, the local young folks in the community. And, um, and as Bilal had indicated, this is a long line, a long litany of, 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 of tragic events, you know, where, where one, one brother was 
was in, last seen in police custody and disappeared, and, and nobody found him. Uh, the police don't know what happened. Um, there have been other brutal uh, incidents with the police in Patterson, and and in and in Jersey too, and in Newark. But uh, so Bilal reached out to me, and um, and and I had asked him, you know, uh, did the family have any type of support? Um, how did the community was the community relating to their loss? And he said, yeah, the people were very upset, but the family, you know, they had the uh, they had the Jack Leg preacher and his crew reach out to them, uh, you know, uh, offering to do the funeral expenses. And uh, I had asked, I, I advised Bilal that he should caution them uh, about who they bring on to be their national or their public spokespeople. And that uh, we would try to reach out to some, um, to some attorneys uh, to see if, uh, if they would be interested in helping the family through this crisis uh, and dealing with the prosecutor and the state right now and, and the police. I think I, I just want to point out too that um, you know, getting getting legal representation for our slain brothers and sisters, and and many in the poor community, in the black community, who cannot afford legal aid, or legal assistance, uh, is very is very um, difficult nowadays because there's very few people attorneys left. Um, in the '60s and early '70s, there were plenty of of conscious, um, active. Um, uh, lawyers, black and white, uh, Puerto Rican. We had, um, of course, we had the, the bill counselors and 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 in the black communities, we've had the Lennox Hines and the Joan Gibbs, and then we had the Robert Boyles and the lead attorney in the Attica case, uh, Liz Fink. We had the law communes. There were there were attorneys. There were movement attorneys to take on class actions, to take on actions, not necessarily just to win them in court, but to raise the level of consciousness and understanding of, of local politics and how people can deal with the system that, that oppresses them. We don't have those types of attorneys anymore. And if we do, they're taking a very low profile. Uh, they seem to uh, gravitate to um, the internet, you know, pontificating on uh, um, on Facebook or on Instagram, but in the trenches, people's lawyers, people's attorneys who would represent the oppressed, who would bring cases against the powerful and against the police unions to educate and liberate our people, uh, these lawyers are far between, far, far from. Instead, we have leadership by victimhood, which you and I, Kalanji and Bilal, we've talked about this over the last couple of years, uh, ever since uh, the, uh, George Floyd, uh, a murder and the rise of hashtag movements, the encapsulation of of genuine uh, uh, liberation struggles, abolitionist movements, the encapsulation by by opportunists, by misleadership, by by uh, by you know just plain um, Negroes, you know bootlickers and with the different agendas. So we don't have leadership anymore uh, by, by, any, by any revolutionary or, or abolitionist organizations or, or coalition thereof. What we have are individual groups and, and individual activists trying to make a difference on the local level in the community, trying to struggle against gentrification, against police murder, against control for public safety, and a whole plethora of other ills that afflict uh, uh, the African community in the U.S. And, and, and lower class working people in general. But we don't have a movement. We don't have a, 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 a broad mass-based movement that is unified around, um, around principles and ideas that are abolitionist in nature. Not reformists in context, but abolition, abolitionist in nature. And that's not to eschew uh, a reform. That's not to say that certain Tactical struggles might require that we mobilize people on a local level to reform a certain policy or reform a certain position that local, the local or state governments have taken. That doesn't mean that we don't understand that in the long term, in terms of building a mass base, in terms of building a movement that is sovereign in this thinking and independent in this action, that this would take um, a, a massive uh, effort, an effort of, of, of unity, 
to bring us all together, not in terms of uniformity, because it's our diversity that makes us dynamic, and to bring us together in terms of principle and understanding how coalitions and alliances really work to empower us all. Individually, separately, we can be dealt with, we can be isolated, we can be marginalized. But as, but as a mass movement, that that's, that's impossible. It's impossible to marginalize a mass movement of over 40 million people of African ancestry and their allies. So it's very important for us to understand that um, that today uh, we don't have the type of uh, activist attorneys that we need in order to bring the type of pressure on the state that needs to be uh, brought. And in the case of this brother Najee, you know, we see there's a there's there's a subplot going on here too, because in Patterson, New Jersey, uh, which is a very uh, a low income a uh, working class, which is a very low income working class um, um, a community um, that, that, um, that there's a large, there's a large influx of, of, of Latino um, um, migrants and Latino community um, in, in the area. There's a large influx in the area. And, and we see that this influx has resulted in a shift in the local politics, in the local political, um, in the local political um, <clears throat> arena. Uh, now you have a Latino mayor. Um, you have an increase of Latinos on the on the um, Patterson Police Department. In other areas, uh, I think Bilal was trying to say something, but it's but uh, he's, he's, he's muted. He's muted. I want to say. I want to say real quick. Um, um, I, I, you, you mentioned a lack of a movement, and I think that that's that's very important. And I remember, um, well, I can't forget, a few years ago, um, you, Cynthia McKinney, and myself, we formed uh, the National Coalition to Combat Police Terrorism. And one of the things that you introduced to folks was um, the idea of decentralizing the police. And I think that. Um, you know, there, there's been since then, there's been a whole cry of defund the police, so on and so forth. For folks who are new to the platform and new to the concept, if you don't mind, can you break down what decentralizing, de decentralization of police is and how important or is it important right now? Now, Well, um, <clears throat> well, uh, you know, decentralization of the police is only, uh, was only part and parcel of a, of a broader strategy, which is um, community and local control of public safety. And public safety includes a whole gamut, a whole range of different institutions. It includes the healthcare institutions, it includes, uh, <clears throat> it includes police, it includes sanitation, because public safety is, is also linked to public health and community uh, and and and, uh, <clears throat> and the quality of life in our community. So so uh, I'm on the I'm on the um, excuse me excuse me excuse me I'm on the so um, public health is is involves a lot of different areas. So decentralization of the police was just one part of it, and decentralization of the police was designed to to directly. Uh, affect the command and control structure of local law enforcement. Decentralization of the police simply meant that in some cities and municipalities, the mayor appoints the police chief. Um, and um, it's the mayor who determines the, uh, the composition of the community review boards, the toothless community review boards. And it's the police unions that exercise an inordinate amount of police of, of public policy, uh, uh, you know, the amount of control over public policy, especially on the municipal and city levels. It's the police unions that exercise more uh, control over our elected officials than we do. Our elected officials are more afraid of the police union than they are uh, of the wrath of our community or, or the opinions in our community. So to change this paradigm, uh, we can uh, put on um, the local ballot, on the local um, agendas, the local um, um, community uh, uh, ballots, 
uh, during elections, uh, uh, both national and local elections. And we need to understand first that all politics is local. That's what we're talking about here. That, that the, the liberation begins at home. It begins in our household. It begins in our streets. It begins in our, co in our community. It begins in our churches and our masjids. That's where liberation starts. That's where organization starts. Um, and uh, we see historically that when, whenever um, the church was involved, for instance, in the liberation struggles of, 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 of in the human rights struggles and the voter registration uh, um, 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 campaigns, that when the church was involved, it mobilized uh, uh, different segments of our community around a common community issue. So all of our institutions really need to be involved in local in local control of our of our um, of our communities. So having said that, decentralization therefore is 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 to put on the ballot that the community that the community is divided into decentralized public safety zones. And each community public safety zone um, is controlled by the local community. They have their own community public safety uh, board that they, that they could elect and bring local residents onto. And that these boards that also have, have a, a, a line control, a, a mechanism of control over recruitment, and, and, and vetting police officers, that uh, decentralization also has an addendum clause to it that requires um, uh, residents, residency uh, for uh, the period of probation that an officer would undergo before he's certified. In most, in most police departments, it's a year to two years. So that means the housing and, and, and various facilities have to be upgraded to accommodate local law enforcement who will be living in the community that they police. And, and this changes the whole paradigm of relationships to ourselves and law enforcement. They're in our community. The fathers and mothers of the kids that are going to school with our kids are also their kids. Um, they have a say so in the community educational boards and all of these things. So decentralization of police was directly um, uh, supposed to um, uh, change the paradigm of power where local elected officials can appoint the, the, the mayor, the mayor or the city council can can appoint a police chief without the input and the say so or, or, or even a referendum from the community itself. So this is how we get police chiefs that come from one venue who are pieces of shit in that venue. They'll come to another venue and they'll become the, 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 the police chief and they'll buy into the culture of, of white supremacy and racist policing. And um, then before you know it, we are watching another episode on TV with a black police chief and a black mayor apologizing for the murder of a black innocent unarmed black uh, man or woman you know so we have all these black faces in high places and they are totally meaningless they are totally uh, we have no power we have no control especially over these institutions that affect our daily lives so that's what decentralization was about, um, um, uh, changing the command and control structure for uh, appointing police chiefs and to circumvent the power of the unions. Now I want to point out too, in closing, I know I've been kind of long on this, but I want to point out too that a key to this is also organizing working people in their own interests. And one of the um, uh, mechanisms to do that is to understand the role that the policemen's uh, uh, associations and unions play in controlling the politics and law enforcement in our community. And they play a significant role in, in determining how to police uh, police in our communities, who polices, and what's said, and when the when the murders of our children and our youth are, are, are highlighted, this police union that steps in between us and justice. So, along with decentralization of 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 of, of, of the police and community control of public safety, is also um, we should bring legal actions in the courts, in the federal courts, in the state courts to decertify the police union, the, the major police unions in our, in, in our states and in our cities, because the police are not workers. They are not working class people. They are not workers. They're armed agents of the state. They have a special status. They're armed agents of the state. They are civil, they are this, this civil employment. We pay their, we pay their taxes and they have their own bill of rights.
over and above the Bill of Rights that ordinary people have. These these pieces of dog doo doo, these perverted ass pigs got their own Bill of Rights. Check that. Check that out. Hmm? So the people that murder us in the streets, the first thing that they do is they hide behind the cloak of legitimacy and they bill of rights. They don't have to talk to nobody within 24 hours, within 72 hours of, of killing one of us. They have automatic attorney who represents them. They take the money from the PBA, which is inadvertently our tax money that goes into their to their funds and, um, and they defend themselves against us. So we need to understand that the police are not workers, that the union has to be decertified, that these unions should be decertified and, and reconstituted along the lines that, uh, that comport with their role in society as armed agents of the state. The, 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 the military, who are, armed, who are also armed agents of the state, but who have no domestic jurisdiction, the military, um, they don't have a police, they don't have a military union. There's no, they have a code of military conduct that they have to adhere to or that's their ass. But they don't have a union. What if, what if, what if, the, what if the United States Navy decided they was going to unionize? And, and they're going to go on strike and say, well, you know, we ain't going to man this aircraft carrier in the Middle East because we don't like the con working conditions. Hmm? That sounds crazy. So why do the armed agents of the state who have the power of life and death over all other workers, why do they have a union to protect them when they murder us? These crackers need to get put in check. They need to get put in check. Um, you know, they need to get their wig checked and they need to get their legal status checked. Hey, hey, as always, as always, we appreciate your analysis um, and we, we definitely got to get you back on, you know, so that before we get back, so you're going to get rid of <laughs> you gonna get rid of me now? <laughs> oh, oh, no, no, oh, no. All good. We, this is how we do around here. But um, I want to. We have to close out. So I got. Uh, I want to hear from Bilal real quick on what it is. What is it that you think, or that you all are asking for, in uh, Patterson at this time? How can we assist? Um, you know, from abroad. Um, you know, and and and, and what's the marching orders? You still on mute, Bilal? Okay. All right, you got me? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, um, we're still calling on, man, the uh, community to call the um, attorney's uh, office. Cloud just disappeared. Yes. So until, so, until, um, until Blau comes back, one of the things that we were discussing, we were going to hold a press conference either later today um, at noon or tomorrow in the morning that we wanted to hold a press conference. We want to also um, try to change the paradigm of how this is reported. We wanted to report at this press conference. We wanted to have black power media and the other alternative black medias be the sole conduit for information coming from the press conference. In other words, instead of having all of the major networks there asking questions, we want only the black alternative media to be there asking the questions and then they will uh, act as a, as a press pool for the rest of the media to give them um, what's happening with the family and the press. This is something I think we should start to do now that we should try to begin to do instead of ha calling the press conferences and having Fox News and MSNBC there and uh, asking redundant questions, questions designed to mis mislead and misdirect and propagandize the police version, that we would rather have the black alternative media, black power media, other um, independent black uh, media, so that when we call for a press conference, these are the... the we stream through our, our our podcast. We stream live, and anybody that wants any questions from the regular media, they would have to get it from you. They would have to uh, use your releases and stuff, to, you know. And I think that that can begin to circumvent the um, the the poverty pimps and the uh, um, and the ambulance chases and uh, and the, and the, and the opportunistic attorneys that haven't that have been taking all of these cases and have won none of them. We, haven't, we don't have one victory in the criminal court 
where those who have come forward paying for these funerals have won. We see that even in the case of Chauvin, um, the piece of shit that was convicted in the George Floyd um, uh, murder and, and, his, and his cronies, we see that the, the standard um, crew of opportunists that have come forward in all of these cases from Tamir Wright to now weren't really involved in that legal, in that legal case. That's probably why they won. You see, and um, so we know that there's only people in this to get to get a bag. Some people are in this to get a bag, to get political clout and political notoriety. I think that we have to understand that we have to deal with this issue in real, in real concrete ways. We have to understand who we are and why we have to uh, uh, act as an independent uh, uh, people and, and look out for our own interests. So uh, I think that what Bilal was, tried, was getting ready to talk about was the upcoming press conference, how we really want to um, try to consolidate um, the black media around these issues and speak directly to them before we talk to the, um, to the uh, corporate media. Hey Amen. I think that is, uh, is a powerful suggestion and we're gonna put it out there to all our comrades in the black community in general, because I agree with you, we've done enough press conferences where they tried to remix what it is we have to say you know and you know the thing is we know the questions that need to be asked and answered so if they want to get that information indeed they should definitely have to come to us and this is something that should be mandatory and this should be the norm amongst folks who consider themselves uh, a part of any type of uh movement or have any type of degree of consciousness or whatever the case is because we already know that the corporate media is um uh, is, is the megaphone for the state. So until we control the narrative, they will continue to have us moving as reactionaries. We're running behind them, requesting that they come in and listen to what we have to say, hoping that they report it through, the, through their outlets. And to me, it simply means that we have no faith in ourselves. So once again, we're talking about a, a form, we're talking about segregation, but at the same time, it's, it's about inclusion. So uh, definitely, I appreciate, you know, you and Bilal coming on. Um, you know, we passed our time, but uh, but definitely it's always a, a pleasure and looking forward to having you on again, comrade. Be safe out there. Okay, you too. Y'all take care of yourselves and power to the people. And let's try to rectify some of this, man. You know, we have to understand that ain't nothing come to a sleeper but a dream. And, um, and, and, and really, you know, we can't just sit here talking about moaning about our kids and our youth and our family members being uh, murdered and killed by armed agents of the state. We have to organize. We have to, we don't have to just get mad, we got to get even. And even means a lot of things to different people, but I'll just leave it like that. Amen. Amen. You know, well, I, I, I know what it. I know what it means to you. Hey, love you, brother. Hey, love you, brother. We'll see you later on. All right, peace out.